We're once again very glad to have Brother Lester Camp to speak to us on the subject of Christ confronted error about faith and knowledge. He was born in Huntington, Indiana and taught high school mathematics for some years, began full-time preaching in 1973, has written for a number of publications and has served as editor of Word and In Word and Doctrine and Matters of the Faith. He presently preaches at the Piedmont Church of Christ in Denver, Colorado and works for the ADT Security. We have known Lester and his family for a long time and had occasions at different times to work closely with him and to know about his dedication to the truth. And this can be said of him, but it can be said of several others who are here, <clears throat> to know the great sacrifices that uh, he and his family have made to do the best they can to proclaim Christ and him crucified and defend the faith. And the more things go in this country and in the Lord's church, the more we're going to have need of people that are so dedicated to the cause of Christ and are real Christians and to be gospel preachers that they're going to have to be determined to support themselves, to start new congregations, and to basically just, is all that's involved, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added to them. And I'm very glad to introduce to you now Brother Lester Camp to speak on this subject. <clears throat> Being here this past several days has been a, a great delight to me to enjoy the fellowship of good brothers and sisters in Christ and faithful preachers of the gospel of Christ. Uh, these occasions are far too rare that allow me to have such one-on-one -on -one and uh, enjoyable fellowship with each other, and I appreciate that greatly. I was impressed when I woke up this morning and saw the sunshine. I talked to my wife last night and she said uh, we have a blizzard in the forecast. So the Roths may be stuck for, with me for another day or two. Uh, eight inches of snow is predicted uh, today. So I would appreciate your prayers for me on my return home to Denver tomorrow. The theme that has been chosen this year is of particular importance, I think, especially in the environment in which we live today in which controversy is avoided at all cost. I like the wording of each of the chapters of the book, each title of each lesson, in the fact that Christ confronted these errors. He did not run and hide someplace. He confronted the errors, and there are plenty of errors in our world today that need to be confronted. Many of those same errors are the ones that Jesus confronted and the ones that we've been dealing with this week. And it is my hope and prayer that as we've studied these lessons together this past several days, that we will carry this idea back home with us and that we will begin, if we have not already begun, to confront error and to deal with that error. Uh, it is uh, according to the example of Jesus, and Jesus is our example, and we should follow any steps. This morning I want to begin with a quotation from G.C. Brewer in a book entitled Contending for the Faith. He writes this. Our Lord Jesus Christ was the most persistent, alert, resourceful, and masterful controversialist that ever lived. He lived at a time when controversy was the order of the day. The Pharisees and Sadducees were the leading sects among the Jews, and they were constantly in disputes among themselves. The Sadducees were cool and calculating, rationalistic and philosophical. The Pharisees were technical and carping. They were past masters in the tricks of sophistry. 
Jesus met the combined efforts of these masters of debate and quibbling and put them to silence. Let me stop in the quotation long enough to cite Titus chapter 1 and verse 11, where elders are told to stop the mouths of those who are gainsayers. That means to put them to silence. That obligation is before elders today. The responsibility is given to them to stop the mouths of those that speak against the truth. Back to the quotation. His, that is Jesus' quick analysis, his penetrating, powerful, and unsparing logic, and his unanswerable and embarrassing ad hominem replies to their assaults have never been equaled among men. They therefore prove him to have been something more than a man. Now, I think as we think about Jesus and his life, we recognize the fact that his miracles proved him to be the Messiah. But let's add on top of that the fact that his argumentation, his confrontation with error, his ability to deal with these things in his life among those religious leaders of his time adds to the fact that Jesus was more than a man, that he was indeed the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus did not live isolated and insulated from others. He, as Paul observed, that nothing that Jesus did was done in a quarter. It wasn't secretly done, it was publicly done. His life was open and before men. He dealt with man's problems and he also dealt with man's questions. Even those questions raised by those who doubted who he was and claimed for themselves all the answers in religious matters. He confronted and confounded the calculating, rationalistic, philosophical Sadducees and also the technical, carping Pharisees. He was able to expose their errors and profoundly answer all their questions and or expose their ulterior deceptive motives. The religious leaders during his earthly ministry, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were bold in their assertion, but most oftentimes they were in error. That error needed to be exposed in order that Honest and good hearts, having heard the word, would keep it and bring forth fruit unto patience. Jesus showed us that teaching the truth means confronting error and distinguishing that error from the truth. This has always been the case. Recall the commission that God gave to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms, now listen, to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Notice in this statement, that error must be rooted out, pulled down, and destroyed in order for us to build and to plant. This is done through argumentation, confrontation, in other words, through controversy. Many today have unfortunately cast aside these very principles. And as Hosea stated, Many have sown the wind, and they will reap the whirlwind. Hosea 8 and verse 7. Much of the weakness and stagnation of the modern church is attributable to the neglect and -and out-and-out rejection of the need to confront and expose error, preferring rather to be accepted by men, if possible all men, Most have withdrawn from controversy and all exposure of error. 
As a result, many members of the church today do not know the difference between the Christ-built and purchased church and the multitude of man-made denominations. Most would rather tolerate and fellowship error than to involve themselves in any controversy. Some would rather maintain the status quo than to stand for the truth and against error. Some would rather maintain friendships and fellowships with those who have once been faithful but now no longer are than to become involved in any controversial issues, though those issues are matters of salvation. Not too long ago, when I left North Carolina, I left a congregation that was so concerned about their former associations with other congregations and other preachers that they refused to accept the truth and stand for the truth. Their buddyhood caused a great deal of problems with their loyalty to Christ, but that was no matter. They would rather continue in that association rather than to break that association and stand for the truth. When I moved to that congregation, they were subscribers to Contending for the Faith. And upon my arrival, they were endorsers of matters of the faith. But before I left, one of the elders had a habit of going around and hiding copies of those publications and refusing to endorse them and to stand with the proclamation of the truth. This was around 2005, and so you know what was going on at that time. The study of Jesus as the great controversialist ought to cause them and us to realize that forsaking the example of Jesus and not following the steps of Jesus will cause us to be lost. This morning we shall look at a couple of occasions in the life of Jesus, the greatest controversialist of all time. And how that he confronted error regarding faith and knowledge. These examples, both of them found in Matthew chapter 22, will illustrate well Jesus' disposition toward error and his willingness to confront that error regardless of his source. These examples, of course, are but the hem of the garment. Many other examples could be given. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, Paul stated, For ye are all sons of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. It is that faith that we are concerned about this morning as we look at these examples of Jesus. It is that body of information, that doctrine of Christ, that new covenant of Christ, that truth, that Jesus upholds. In John 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye truly my disciples, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The first example that we're looking at this morning is found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 33. It is an example in which Jesus is called in question with regard to the subject of the resurrection. There are parallel accounts of this situation found in Mark chapter 12 and in Luke chapter 20. I remind us that according to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19, if this life only we have hope in Christ, We are of all men most pitiable, most miserable. And I remind us also that the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection ultimately of all, is a fundamental doctrine of Christ and an essential one as we see it appearing again and again in those sermons that are recorded in the book of Acts. 
In Matthew chapter 22, let's begin reading in verse 15. In this place, then, the, uh, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. I want us to notice that the questioners on these occasions had ulterior motives. They were not sincerely interested in the truth in these matters. They were interested in, as Matthew says, entangling Jesus in his speech. But of course it did not work. And the result was that the truth was proclaimed and error was refuted and Jesus stood with the truth because he is true. Here the Sadducees approached Jesus with a question which they believed would force Jesus into a situation where he would have to give up his position. The Sadducees did not believe in the spirit world. Neither did they believe in life after death. As the inspired Luke described this sect and the Pharisees, he said, for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. That statement is an interesting one, for it comes in the context of Paul before the Sanhedrin. And recognizing that this group of men, these religious leaders of his day, uh, sought to kill him, and that nothing that he would say would make any difference with regard to the matter, he recognized some of them to be Pharisees and some of them Sadducees, and so he says that the reason I stand before you this day is because I am a Pharisee, and I believe in the resurrection. And so the result was that the Pharisees and the Sadducees turned on themselves and Paul escaped. Therefore, to them, to the Sadducees, the resurrection was impossible. Here is the situation they presented to Jesus. There was a woman who over the course of time and because of the death of her husbands had married seven brothers consecutively. Their question stated in Matthew 22, verse 28, Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. They were using the argumentation of ad hominem. This type of argument is based upon the opponent's position and not their own. It is designed to bring to light some contradiction with his position and with some known truth. And it asks that the individual to solve the problem to give up his position. This approach is useful in clearing the ground and so that the true position can be erected by exploding the false position. Jesus uses this form of argumentation. But on this occasion, it is the Sadducees that bring forth this argumentation. They suppose that the resurrection is true, though they didn't believe it. Knowing that Jesus believed in the resurrection, and by basing their argument on this idea, they're hoping to trip Jesus up and cause other people standing around to realize the error of what Jesus is teaching. Based upon the assumption of the resurrection, at that time, that is the time of the resurrection, the question is pertinent, whose wife would she be? According to McGarvey and his commentary, this was evidently a favorite Sadducean argument against the resurrection. On the assumption that the marital state is continued after the resurrection, this makes the doctrine of the resurrection appear to be ridiculous because seemingly it involves difficulties which even brothers could hardly figure out and which would ultimately fall into the lap of God to resolve arbit arbitrarily. Jesus' first point in his reply was that they were obviously ignorant of the scriptures and the power of God. Listen to his words. 
Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Matthew chapter 22, verses 29 through 30. He simply stated that the biblical doctrine of the resurrection does not involve the continuance of the marriage relationship. Some questions, even some questions that we receive, seem to be unanswerable because they are based on false assumptions or situations and conditions which are simply not true. Therefore, any attempt to answer the question would proceed on the assumption of this false situation as has been declared. The question here is robbed of its validity because it has no foundation in fact. This was the error underlying the question of, in the resurrection, whose life shall she be of the seven? They were in error because of their ignorance. They thought it was a difficult question because regardless of whose wife one said that this woman became in the resurrection of life, the claim of the one of the other brothers could be also stated. According to their reasoning, the question was impossible to answer because it assumed uh, the ability to discern all of these relationships which would be very difficult indeed. But the truth of the matter was that it assumed something that was not true. It was false. It assumed that the resurrection life would be a continuation of the life in such relationships as marriage. As a matter of fact, fact now, truth, the marriage relationship would not exist in heaven and therefore the question fell to the ground. Their question was not an evidence of an inner difficulty in Jesus' position, but an indication of an expression of their ignorance concerning the resurrection life. Secondly, it is important to notice several other facts about this conversation. These Sadducees knew something about the scriptures. But according to Jesus' appraisal and according to the facts of the matter, they were ignorant of the truth. They had couched their question on the Leverite law found in the writings of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. It should also be recalled that even the devil was able to quote scriptures when tempting Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. The Sadducees, true enough, knew some scriptures and they were able to cite them when they believed these scriptures served their purpose. The Pharisees could not successfully handle this question because they could not refute the assumption that marriage continued beyond death. But Jesus could answer the question and did clearly exposing the error on the basis of his own authority. He overturned the position of the Sadducees by simply stating that death ends all physical earthly ties. He stated in Matthew 22 verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are of the, uh, as the angels of God in heaven. Thirdly, Jesus turns his focus on to the spirits of men and the proof of the resurrection by noticing the common ground which existed between the Sadducees and himself. The Sadducees believed that God has spoken through Moses. They were right. Jesus believed the same. In fact, they had earlier cited Moses in framing this very question. So Jesus returns to Moses to establish the fact that death does not end all. The Sadducees held that a dead man had ceased to exist and that he had vanished into nothingness. But Jesus states, listen to him, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, 
I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Matthew chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. The text to which Jesus refers here is found in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Mark's account of this same conversation and this statement of Jesus contains some additional significant wording. Listen to Jesus here. Mark chapter 12, verse 26. And is touching the dead that they rise. Have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. If we put these two passages together, Matthew chapter 22 and Mark chapter 12, there is an interchangeable nature between God has spoken to you by in Matthew chapter 22, and in the book of Moses, you read this information, indicating that God spoke to them by Moses. Jesus states that if the spirits of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, as the Sadducees had claimed, non-existent, then God would have been confirming here, or stating here, that he is the God of non-existence of nothingness. How absurd. Long after the death of these three men, God proclaimed to Moses in the burning bush, I am their God. It followed with irresistible force that they were still living in some sense. Since God said, I am their God, death had not ended at all. Their spirit still lived. He did not say, I was their God. And since God said, I am their God, it followed that they were still living and death had not ended at all. Their relationship with God had continued beyond the grave. According to the word of God, the body separates from the spirit. That's called death. James chapter 2 verse 26. But the Bible nowhere declares or indicates that when this separation occurs that the spirit dies. Rather, we find Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Notice as we look at this argument of Jesus, that this argument turns on one word and its tense, the word am. It should be noticed that the word of God is word for word inspired. And even the tense of the verb is highly significant. It should also be noticed that this was a powerful argument. Then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And after that, they durst not ask him any question at all. Luke chapter 20, verses 39 and 40. Further notice that Jesus strongly states the case against the Sadducees' position. He states in conclusion, He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And then notice these significant words. Ye therefore do greatly err. Mark chapter 12, verse 27. You remember at the beginning of the discussion, as recorded in Matthew, Jesus states to them emphatically, you do err not knowing the scripture. And now in the conclusion, as recorded in Mark's account of this situation, he concludes with the same idea, ye therefore do greatly err. Our Lord, in these statements, was not unloving nor unkind, as some might suggest today, when he states this simple fact. Some of my brethren would never be so bold or so clear in stating, you do greatly err. Some of my brethren are so afraid of offending people 
They will not tell them the truth, even when their souls are at stake. Such may not offend men, but such is offensive to God. The second example we're looking at this morning from Matthew chapter 22 is the question raised now by the Pharisees concerning the law and the commandments of the law. The Pharisees were apparently aware of the effective way in which Jesus had dealt with the question of the Sadducees. And so they select from their number a lawyer who can come to Jesus with a question. Hopefully, they can discredit Jesus since the Sadducees were unable to do so. We read in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 and 35, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. Notice there is a motive behind the question. They are trying him. They are trying to ensnare him. They are trying to trip him up. They are tempting him. So they return to put his knowledge of the law to the test. Whatever Jesus said, they thought, would allow them, therefore, room to dispute his knowledge. For this topic was a topic that they had argued for many years. Haynes writes this concerning this situation. The rabbis had woven a web of their traditions all over the Mosaic law. They had, so they thought, counted, classified, weighed, and measured all the commandments of the ceremonial and moral law and had concluded that there were 248 affirmative and 365 negative precepts the latter being the number of the letters of the Decalogue and also the number of days of the year. They reasoned that all the commandments, the directive and prohibitive, could not be of equal value, which were the greater and which were the first of all. According to the statement of Jewish writers, there had been an old and unending dispute among the rabbis as to which was the greatest commandment. Some held that it was the law which commanded sacrifices. Others, that which commanded the wearing of phylacteries. Others contended for those about purification, while yet others about those, uh, those things that pertain to feast. But as they reckoned the commandments of Moses as numbering over 600, there was plenty of room for argument. You can imagine how this would take place over the centuries. They were arguing unendingly about which of these commandments was the greatest. So if they had not been able to resolve it over the centuries, surely this would be a perplexing situation to Jesus. And so they come with that question. Jesus, however, knew well their intent. He realized that their intention was to spend time, really waste time, in theoretical discussions about what was the, great, the greatest of all commandments and which was the least important. Jesus gives them an answer immediately. He gives them the first and second commandment and then states, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. His response was one that was first of all true and secondly, one that included all the law and the prophets. Additionally, he used language that they would immediately understand. These Jews would know what it meant that the law and the prophets hung on these things, for it was the Jewish expression. He taught them not that any one commandment was greater or smaller, heavier or lighter than another that one might be set aside or neglected, but that all sprang from these two as their root and principle and stood in living connection with them. All revelation was one connected whole, not just jointed ordinances of which the letter was to be weighted, but a life springing from love to God 
and love to man. Furthermore, as the hook supports all, so to keep these two commandments is to do all that is required by the scriptures. He who loves God as required will keep all of God's commandments. And he who loves his neighbor will fulfill every obligation to his neighbor. The lawyer went away with the idea, not that one specific commandment of God is more important than another, but that the great thing is to have the heart doing all that God commands. Therefore, let us look more closely at this discussion of Jesus with the lawyer. Jesus again quotes scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. By the way, a passage which every devout Jew recites twice every day, even to this present time. They were familiar with it. And as he cites this scripture, he allows the power of the word to answer the question. He responds, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Why is this the first commandment? It is because God is the creator of man and therefore man should serve him above all others. The, this commandment is the foundation upon which all the other commandments are built. Removing this commandment erodes the very substance of all the other obligations and commandments God has given to man. We are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The heart involves emotions, volition, or will, and thought. We are to love him completely, withholding nothing. We are to love him with all of our being. This is total commitment and devotion to him. Divided love and divided service, according to Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, are impossible. There is an ultimate test of love. Jesus stated, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15. That is exactly Jesus' point here. If we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we will submit our will to God and do all he has commanded. Paul described it this way in Romans 12 and verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Defining love as an emotion has caused many to conclude that it does not make much difference whether we are careful to do what God commands and in the way that God tells us to do these things. True love, however, according to the Bible, causes us to be careful to do all God's will. In fact, when we grow in our love for God, we grow also in our concern for doing his will. The second greatest commandment is to love our neighbor as ourselves. It reflects the idea expressed in John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Since man was created in the very image of God and since man is the object of God's love and Christ's redeeming death, who is it that can love God without loving our fellow man? John stated it this way, 1 John 4, verse 20, If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? We can see this in this, how different it would be if man were a mere animal, or the byproduct of some blind workings of nature, or some mere accident. But such is not the case. Man was created by God in his image. In this situation, even though Jesus realized that the one that asked the question was not sincerely interested in knowing the answer in order to apply it to his life, Jesus gave the answer which 
encourage practical application. His answer furthermore ignored distinctions that the lawyer was wanting to make but gave the lawyer obligations which needed to be recognized and also obeyed. Jesus recognized the common ground of the law. The question had to do with the law and Jesus' answer was from the law. We need to learn to deal with questions in the way that Jesus did here. I'd like to close with this statement. From the introduction to the book, Jesus as a Controversialist, B.J. Radford stated, Truth will prevail only as it is championed by its defenders and propagators. And error will be wounded, if at all, by some controversial tongue. Let us determine within ourselves to follow our Lord in all things, including the way in which he was a controversialist. Thank you for your attention. Very excellent material and very needful and up to the point. And I guess to use an overworked word, very relevant for our times. I commend you to this not only for the message he has prepared and set forth here and in the book, but I hope you notice the method of Bible study that he used to reach those conclusions. And I commend that to you as much as I do anything because I think he exemplified the proper approach to right dividing the word of truth and ascertaining the authority of our Lord as it is set out in the New Testament for us to be sure that we can know what we're doing and know that we know it. I uh, hope if you didn't get that, that you'll go to the uh, book Look at it again and notice how he approached his study. That can certainly help us in our own approach uh, to Bible study and rightly dividing the word of truth. We will uh, be having our worship period regular on Sunday morning worship period next. So until about.